Hey everyone, so as many of you know, I have a bit of a reputation at this point for debunking creationists. And because of this, a number of people have reached out to me to let me know about a particular video called Evolution School's Biggest Lie by a channel called I Am Lucid uh, to tell me that this was sort of a typical creationist uh, video and that I might uh, have fun debunking it. So I went to just take a look real quick. Um, it, it, didn't, it, it doesn't have that many views as of right now, it has 73,000 views, but the channel has in the vicinity of a million subscribers, so it didn't seem to me like something that was worth doing a full debunk, but then it occurred to me, what if I was to try out sort of like a reaction style video? Could be, you know, lower effort for me, but I still kind of get to go through and, uh, and debunk to an extent. Um, I don't actually know how to do this is the thing. So I'm just recording on the webcam like I normally do and I'm going to watch the video and then I'm going to put it together in post. I don't know if I'm going to like overlay images at certain points or um, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try it. And if it works, if I can figure it out and if people like it, maybe I'll do more stuff like this because uh, I think it's going to be a lot easier than the debunks, which sometimes take a long time for me to put together and everything. So um, let's go ahead and check this out. Again, I don't had never heard of this guy. Uh, I still don't know anything about him. I haven't looked at any of his content, other content, or this video. I just kind of looked at two seconds just to like see what it was. But now I'm going to actually watch the video and we'll do some live commentary here and see what this is all about. Ready? Let's go. I'm skeptical of the claim. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation. Okay, I got to jump in right away right here. Uh, I did not know that, I didn't know the angle this guy was coming from. Scientific descent from Darwinism, as many of you know, if you don't know, this is the deceiving manifesto from Discovery Institute, and I think I heard uh, Michael Behe's voice in there. Uh, so, given what I've been doing lately to those guys, uh, I, I, I think I, I may be the right guy for the job here. So, let's keep watching. And natural selection. Who account for the complexity of life. I uh, wrote about 10 icons of evolution in my book. I could have written about more, but I had to stop somewhere. Um, survival of the fittest has had a disastrous history. It does not sustain any kind of Darwinian prediction that can be intelligently derived from Darwinian. We don't even know how to define life, let alone knowing how to spark it to begin. Schools want you to. Uh, does anyone else want to tell this guy what I've just been doing to James Tour for a while now? Um, Per, I think that was Berlinski too, was the other guy. So these are just, it's, the, uh, I, I haven't seen what the guy's going to do yet, but he's clearly teeing himself up to be regurgitating a bunch of Discovery Institute talking points. Uh, I also, that's a weird clip for him to choose from James Tour, where he just says, we don't even know how to define life. I mean, that's totally tangential, but also not really true. We have a pretty good defini working definition of life in terms of cellularity, metabolism, reproduction, response to stimuli, homeostasis, etc. Uh, I mean, I don't know what angle he's going to take here, that we don't know what life is or something like that. Kind of doesn't really matter. Life is just a word that we made up, right? Words just represent ideas. Nature doesn't care about the words that we use or our need to categorize and define any, uh, everything. It just does what it does, right? So, I don't know. We Let's... came from apes. They said that this theory was so solidified in reality that it's practically a fact. We did not come from apes. We are apes. We are apes. We are in the family of great apes, just like we are mammals, just like we are vertebrates, just like we are eukaryotes. These are taxa. We belong to the taxon of apes. We are apes. Um, this is not a good start. They lied to you. Lock in with me and let me fix your brain. Oh, dear God. He uses my font. I think that's my font. Gotham Bold. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. That's, that's my font. <laughs> 
Now before all of the biology majors start flexing in the comments down below with their PhDs, classical music, and British accents, let me explain myself. I am not anti-evolution. I do believe that human beings actually have evolved. We have seen this. We can measure this. It's an undeniable fact, but it's on a much smaller scale and more importantly, a scale that we can actually test. These can be measured within human populations that I'll explain later on in the video, but I do believe that humans actually have evolved. <clears throat> this is more of a Kent Hovind style thing here where you're a, uh, uh, he's he's getting ready to do microevolution yes macroevolution no um so I'll let him do that Let's clear up the first of the biggest lies. With neo-Darwinism, the evidence revolves around the theory and not the other way around. The bias will become a lot more clear to you as you watch the rest of this video. School left this part out of the textbooks, but Darwin himself actually said, analogy would lead me one step farther, namely to believe that all animals and plants are descended from some one prototype. But analogy would be a deceitful guide. All right, he... he he threw he threw out the term neo darwinism i'm pretty sure he does not know what that means cuz he's not able to talk about it in a uh, he, he didn't even like if you're going to throw that term out you have to define it darwinism which at this point is very antiquated which i'm sure he does not know is just uh ad, is just uh, evolution by natural selection we're really just talking about uh, differences in the population being selected for by natural uh, by natural selection the neo darwinism uh, which was developed maybe 60, 70 years later, incorporated a bunch of different mechanisms other than natural selection because there are many mechanisms by which evolution uh, operates. And then even neo-Darwinism at this point is not something that we, it, it's not the pinnacle of, of evolutionary biology. Uh, our incredible understanding of genetics now is uh, just, these are, not, these are not terms that represent the current status of evolutionary biology. So, uh, yeah, th well, again, this is out of the DI playbook, so I don't think, uh, I think he's probably just going to, like, be regurgitating DI talking points the whole time. Let's see what he does. But you're taught in school that he said the exact opposite, aren't you? That Darwin himself believed that we all came from one single prototype, when in reality, in his books, he says that he doesn't believe that. That's because school taught you neo-Darwinism, not Darwinian evolution. The differences are vast. Darwinian evolution was based on Darwin's observations, the theory is based within the scientific method, and does not have such far-fetched conclusions. For an example, he believed in natural selection within reasonable limits that would be an undeniable truth. Now, he just showed a quote where Darwin posited that it's possible that all life arose from a single common ancestor. And in fact, that is the status of evolutionary biology. So I don't know if he's trying to like throw Darwin under the bus and salvage him at the same time or something. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. Neo-Darwinism is a fork of Darwinism. It's modified and often politically charged. It tries... No. No, it is not politically charged. It is natural selection plus about half a dozen other uh, mechanisms. So I don't know where he's getting this. That is just a lie. To find definite answers deeper than Darwin ever claimed. It does this through an artificial epigenetics and genetic mutations beyond the th normal three, which are insertions, deletions, and duplications. Okay, yeah, these are other mechanisms. So where I don't get where the politics are here. This theory brings in specific gene expression and draws bold conclusions from vague evidences. I'll explain more later on. The classic uh, pluralization of a word that does not need to be pluralized, evidences. Video, but this is the most known theory and Darwin is wrongly credited for the creation of this theory. It's no, Darwin is credited for Darwinism, which he developed in the 1860s, and then Neo-Darwinism is what biologists were doing in the early 20th century, and then now we're doing much more sophisticated things still. Um, so it's just, he clearly his, has, has, has read up on DI talking points, but has never bothered to even Google the term Neo-Darwinism. I'd say that would be a good start. That would be something he could do if he wanted to know the definitions of the words he's using. But you're taught in school and it's not the truth. The neo-Darwinist leading theory of how they assume life started on Earth was by something called abiogenesis. To put simply, uh, a pond of amino acids got heated from hydrothermal vents in the ocean floor that eventually evolved into all different types of life. 
Wow, you're skipping a lot of steps. <laughs> no, amino acids did not turn into life. Uh, I guess I, I guess it would be pointless to try to summarize my hours and hours of content on James' tour here, but uh, the origin of life is uh, origin of life research is an incredibly sophisticated field, and he just tried to summarize 60 years of research in a sentence uh, by fixating on amino acids. I assume he's going to do the classic uh, Miller Urey is dumb, so origin of life research is dumb, uh, something along those lines. Natural selection over time plus random DNA copying mistakes somehow equals all of life on Earth. It's a sad attempt at drawing a conclusion of the origin of life, in my opinion. Okay, so he clearly does not even understand the difference between origin of life and evolution because he's talking about he's talking about evolution by natural selection of DNA-based organisms, which, by the way, DNA evolved after life, life first, then DNA. Uh, so he's constantly equating the two, not really recognizing that they're actually completely separate. Well, not completely separate. All right, there is chemical evolution, but. Uh, 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 the evolution of the genome to produce different biological organisms is, is way later than origin of life. They don't really have much to do with each other. I mean, it's unbelievable to even accept this theory. Even if this was possible, it doesn't go into the maintenance and subsequent reproduction of the organism that was created. What? Uh, okay, let's let him. There are more prerequisites to this theory, such as spontaneous generation, which is basically saying that something can come from nothing. Uh, okay, <laughs> so this, so uh, he teed this up by talking about abiogenesis, and now he's trying to talk about spontaneous generation, which has nothing to do with abiogenesis. This is something that was discredited in like the 17th or 18th century with Francesco Redi, uh, because they would see uh, maggots coming out of rotting flesh, and so they thought, hey, what if maggots just appear? on rotting flesh. And then he figured out, no, the flies come and they lay the eggs and the maggots are coming out of the eggs. So spontaneous generation, the idea that life appears out of thin air uh, was discredited several centuries ago and is not true and has absolutely nothing to do with abiogenesis, the process, where, the process by which the first unbelievably simple life became assembled uh, through chemical processes. Uh, so this is a very embarrassing equivocation. Or life can come from no life, which is obviously not true, was actually... No, it obviously is true because there was once not life and then there was life. So life came from non-life. We're trying to figure out how, and we've made a lot of progress, and it has absolutely nothing to do with spontaneous generation was actually disproven in the 19th century by a French chemist named Louis Pasteur. And before him... No, it was done first by Francesco Redi, and that's spontaneous generation, which has nothing to do with abiogenesis. Before him, it was thought that if you close a jar of milk and then bacteria grows inside the jar of milk, it was because the milk would produce this life spontaneously, and that the life would come out of nowhere, almost as if it was a magical creation. He came to the conclusion that there were already organisms alive inside, and the bacteria there, we just couldn't see. So that's why it would grow, because it was always there. Right, that's that's mildly, roughly correct. And Pastor, I, I'm pretty sure, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Reddy did this first, but Pastor also did this with bacteria, uh, but again, has nothing to do with abiogenesis. Come out of nowhere. Additionally, abiogenesis has never been recreated, and the closest scientists have come to recreating it is the creation of simple peptides using artificial conditions. <laughs> okay, a lot, a lot wrong in one sentence. Uh, no, we've done much more than create peptides. We've generated all of the relevant biomolecules and their polymers. And uh, systems chemistry uh, has shown us how, uh, how, how self-replicating molecules even can come about. Uh, so we're, we're quite a ways along towards even, you know, towards protocells and things like that. So, so no, that's not the best we've done. We've done much, 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 much better. Uh, but more importantly, we don't have to recreate it 
Uh, we don't have to recreate something to substantiate it. We don't have to build a star in order to know how stars form, right? That's not how science works. We make observations and we figure things out empirically, right? Life is here. We're trying to figure out how life began, and it's unbelievably more complicated, right? The process of abiogenesis took millions and millions of years uh, through the principles of systems chemistry, uh, where, you have si where you have systems of molecules that are self-replicating and then complexifying over time until certain, uh, you know, suites of peptides develop some kind of metabolic capability. You're, they're enhancing their ability to self-replicate. They're in competition with one another, right? This is, this is kind of the, hopefully we'll get to talk more about this because this is maybe the key thing that creationists don't understand when they think that a scientist is supposed to just go, oh, here's some molecules and we made a cell and boom, it's alive and there's life. And they think that that we can't do that means nature didn't do it, when in reality, nature also did not do that. No one is proposing that in nature some molecules floated together and made a cell. No, we had assemblages of molecules enclosed in vesicles that were self-replicating and complexifying over millions of years before those systems resembled something that we could feasibly call life due to the internal, uh, ab the, inter the, the abilities of the molecules enclosed in that vesicle, namely metabolic capabilities. So, all right, I'm not surprised, but yeah, this is this is really bad so far. So the peptides created were not capable of having a secondary structure, let alone a globular structure. Whilst okay, that uh, okay, I, I don't know what he's talking about. If uh, a, a, pro, a, a peptide that has a particular folding structure in aqueous solution is gonna fold that way, so. I don't even know what I don't even know what he thinks he's talking about. So at the same time, ignoring all the conditions required to keep that enzyme stable and prevent it from denaturing artificially, this is very likely to not ever have. What? Why would it denature? It's just it's it's proteins in water. Why would it denature? I don't understand not ever have happened naturally. Our Graham Cooks, who serves as the distinguished professor of analytical chemistry, said that proteins are formed from amino acids by loss of water, and loss of water in water will not occur because the process will be reversed. Okay, so those of you who have watched my James Tour content are probably smiling right now. Um, yes, uh, amino acids don't just magically couple to form peptides. They require chemical activation. And there are dozens and dozens of proposed prebiotically plausible chemical activators that uh, will facilitate that. Even though it is endothermic, uh, it can happen. So we're talking about the difference between kinetics and thermodynamics. I really don't think he knows what thermodynamics is, uh, but let's see if he brings it up later. By the water. This is thermodynamically forbidden. There are a very large number of studies showing peptide formation, but they all use catalyst or modified amino acids to make species unlikely to exist naturally. It's simply uh, no, yeah, catalysts, so naturally occurring catalysts, so naturally occurring peptide formation, uh, there's, there's not a problem here. There's not a problem here. We just couldn't have happened naturally, and believing in so is a far stretch outside the bounds of reality. It's not, you just haven't looked into it at all ever for a second and can't, and have no capability of, uh, digesting the research that studies exactly this. Uh, right, so there's dozens and dozens and dozens of studies uh, looking for ways that uh, prebiotic peptide formation occurred. Uh, and so if you're not going to look at any of them, you, there's no reason for you to talk about it. There are different stages of human evolution in the theory, the latest of which are Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapien, respectively. The Homo sapiens. But here is, do we have a common ancestor to these species? Are they our ancestors that we've evolved from? Or are they a subspecies? And if we didn't evolve from them, then why did they go extinct? Did we just wipe them out and smoke them all and outperform them to their extinction? The latest claim isn't too hard to believe, actually. If you look at the nature of our species, what would we do if somebody just claimed a brand new land, a brand new territory on the planet Earth? Immediate war would be waged to gain control of the resources and of the land. We don't shake their hand and, you know, team up like we're playing a squad in Fortnite. We go in for the kill and take all the land that we could for our own monetary and beneficial gain. That's the nature of our species. Literally every single country would wage war against this little small country that has no army because what are they going to do? Stop us? We want the money and... Okay, I, I, that's not really the way the world works anymore. Uh, a thousand years ago, yeah, def or you know, 
less than a thousand years ago. So, all right, I'll give him this. Resources, so we'll do it anyways. That's how we're built. The oldest Homo sapien fossil on Earth is a skull found in Jebel Urhud, Morocco. It was thought to initially be 40,000 years old, then it was recently reappraised in the year 2017 to actually be roughly 300,000 years old. Now, this is crucial because it shakes up the entire theory of evolution by slowing down the timeline way further than is possible to hold the current theory. The difference between our... I don't think that that is... Uh, I'm, I'm not much of an anthropologist. But uh, my understanding was that Homo sapiens came about something like 200 or 300,000 years ago. Uh, so I don't see the problem with finding remains that are that old because we have remains of species that predate us as well. So I don't see the problem here. Our skull, currently in the 300,000 year old skull, is from Jabal al Hud, was that it had a double arched eyebrow ridge, a larger and protruding nasal cavity, a broader face, and a smaller brain casing. If that's all that happened in 300,000 years, then how many years ago were we apes? Now, if the end of. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, evolution is very slow, uh, it takes millions and millions of years. So that we are morphologically very similar to our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago is not that strange and uh, completely expected and in line with uh, what evolutionary biology predicts. Then again, how long ago were we apes? We are currently apes. Humans are apes. What he means is how long ago did how long ago were our ancestors something that kind of looks like monkeys today? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but certainly millions of years. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, this area is not my forte, so I don't remember the name of the exact species and how long ago it forked off. But um, this is all very, very very well understood by anthropologists. Uh, there is no controversy about it. Um, there's there's no controversy in the, in the anthropology community. The only people who, who pretend there is anything to discuss are people like Casey Luskin, who just lie about it. Uh, and this is probably where he's getting this part of his playbook, is from people like that. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's, uh, there, there's not much to talk about here. Homo erectus was said to end around 27 to 100,000 years ago, and this Jebel al-Hud Homo sapien, like us, was alive 300,000 years ago, then that must mean that erectus and sapien were alive together. However, the current theory claims that we went back further and further in stages, that our species was once their species. Now, this is problematic because... A third spe... Look... <laughs> okay, this this may be another thing that creationists don't really understand is how speciation works, right? You you have a very large population of animals, and then some small subpopulation. Within that s small subpopulation, there are variations, right? And you get a speciation event until this uh, this subpopulation is just distinct enough from the larger population that it merits retroactively going back and, and calling it a different species and 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 maybe they are even not able to to uh to produce f viable offspring with the original population right it's it's very subtle um but when that happens the original population doesn't immediately die by virtue of a new species of, of speciation having occurred nature isn't there going oh i got the next thing that i wanted so the rest can die no, they continue to exist and then compete. That's what natural selection is. So most species go extinct. The overwhelming majority of all species that have ever, ever existed are extinct. Homo sapiens is not extinct. We won. We did really well. And here we are. Um, so that there is overlap of species is 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 very trivial to understand. I'm not sure why he would think that not only that everything would be segmented like that, but that evolutionary biology says it should because it certainly does not. Because not only do we have fossil records showing us that Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, like us, being alive at one point, but we also have Homo habilis and Homo erectus being alive and hunting within one kilometer of each other at the same exact... So what? Same exact time. 
For these to be alive at the same time and in the same geographical region shows us that they weren't ancestors of each other. They weren't going back in stages and it'd be a but they are, yes, if there's overlap, but if one, if, if, if one species is derived from another, that's an ancestral relationship, right? It doesn't mean that there's no overlap between the populations. It's not that hard to understand. And it'd be a lot more rational to assume that they were separate entities entirely. So it's not far-fetched to believe that one homo class outperformed and wiped out the other from Habilis to Erectus to Sapien. Another point of argument is that the Earth didn't exist infinitely. So we have a timeline that we have to work with. The Earth has been a viable place of life for the last 4.6 billion years, which might make... Okay, so he's not a young Earth creationist, he is revealing, so that's good. Makes sense to you, however, we've had many mass extinction events such as the Cretaceous Paleogene event, reducing the timeline of evolution to about 66 million years only. So with that in mind, the timeline no longer adds up. If we what? Uh, those didn't wipe out, uh, those extinction events didn't wipe out all of life. Some of them wiped out most of it. Some of them wiped out as much as 90%, I think. Um, life continued to exist and continue to evolve. Also, 66 million years. I, I don't know where, where he's going. He's talking about hominid species that existed a handful of millions of years over the past handful of millions of years. So what does this extinction event have to do with anything? I don't know. We were still Homo sapiens for the last 300,000 years minimum and have undergone limited evolution since. Then how many years ago did we evolve from a pond of amino acids again? Doesn't make sense. Uh, about 4 billion... About 4 billion uh, would be when there was a pool of amino acids and, and other things. That's a long time, uh, 4 billion years. It's a really long time. So, yeah, scratch, scratch, your, scratch your head on that. Doesn't make sense. These fossils are probably the first thing that come to mind when you think about human evolution. A lot of these... Okay, sorry, just f fake fossils. I mean, it's like, come on, what, what, do you do? what do you mean fake fossils? Like like they don't exist, like we didn't find them? I mean, are you, are you going to dispute evidence or are you going to pretend the evidence doesn't exist? Like pick a lane, you know what I mean? I don't know. A lot of these models that we've used to visualize evolution are actually so weak in authenticity that one of them is a fully fledged human-like ape model with the legs and arms and feet and everything that's fully constructed from a single tooth of a- No, I think he's probably trying to talk about Lucy and Australopithecines. Um, and no, uh, we have, I, I don't want to give the wrong number here. I was going to say hundreds of specimens, and I think that's true. Maybe it's less than 100. I'm not sure. But uh, we have many, many, many. This is this is what Luskin did in the thing, right? They wanted to be just Lucy, and Lucy's incomplete. Um, uh, it's not. It's not just Lucy. There's a lot and lots and lots and lots of specimens of Australopithecus uh, afarensis. Australopith. There's other. Uh, there there are other species within the Australopithecine genus. Uh, again, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't remember. All of them, all I know is that we have many, many, many specimens, uh, something that you could find out by Googling for 10 seconds. So this single tooth thing uh, is a bunch of crap. Of a pig, my boy! When Lucy was first discovered- Of a pig? Uh, no. No. First discovered in the 1970s, people thought that she was the missing link between humans and apes. Now experts usually agree- yeah, Australopithecines are something like a missing link between ancestral species that more closely resemble what we, what, what he means by apes, right? Like gorillas and orangutans and things like that. It is a, it is a, it is a species that is morphologically intermediate from those kinds of species in Homo sapiens, right? It's, it is a species that is sort of like newly walking upright and still retains certain morphological characteristics of those prior species where they're still trying to get around in trees a lot. So like the way the arms are constructed and things like that. But uh, certain aspects of the, um, of the anatomy make it undeniably uh, a, an upright walker. 
uh, check out my Luskin debunk for more info on that. Do you usually agree that this was just a three foot tall chimpanzee? No. Uh, literally zero anthropologists would agree with that statement. So, no. Not a human in the making. The reason that they thought so was because of their neo-Darwinian presuppositions. No, that's not how science works, and that's not what anthropologists do. They actually look at the anatomy of the specimen, and they look... I mean, I'm struggling to remember exactly what, we, what, the, what the morphological features were. Uh, there was the valgus knee. It's the way the pelvis is, uh, is shaped, uh, where the foramen magnum is. Uh, the way the spinal alignment uh, has to be. So th th we're talking about hundreds of specimens, I believe, of of a species which we call Australopithecus. Well, that's a genus, Australopithecus, and then the these species within that genus that are undeniably morphologically intermediate between those ape species that he's talking about and humans. There is no denying this, and no credible anthropologist would ever deny this. Um, so you're just denying an entire field of science. Sorry. Remember when I mentioned earlier that the evidence fits around the theory and not the other way around? We didn't recover any feet or hand bones from Lucy. And yet we did from hundreds of other specimens. But it was assumed that she had human feet and human hands. No, not human feet or human hands. Australopithecine feet and hands which have a more which had an intermediate morph morphology well okay i'm not an expert on australopithecine feet and hands but in general australopithecus was morphologically intermediate i mean i can't keep saying this over and over again but this further proves my point that there is a definite bias here the handle for sand man was made by an anthropology professor named reiner prosh he falsified age determinations of fossils during his 30-year career and in 2010 made up data to support his claims. I don't know who that is, and I have never heard of that. Um, I bet it's not true, but even if it is, this is a classic tactic of, uh, oh, they like to do this with the, he uh, the heckle uh, embryo drawings, where he kind of fabricated the drawing like 200 years ago, but then we later developed embryology and found out that that's pretty much what they look like anyway. Uh, so this is uh, just like that one guy did a thing. So the whole field is wrong. And that's not how science works. Um, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, there's a bias. There's a bias here, buddy. And the bias is denying science that you don't like. He literally risked and lost his entire 30 years worth of work to falsify the handle for sand man and ruin his entire life worth of credibility. This is the fattest L I've seen anybody take in my life. And you can see that he had this determination to prove neo-Darwinian evolution to us to a point where he risked his entire life worth of credibility for it. Yeah, this this is a popular narrative. This just like uh, the, this 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 intellectual dishonesty, this this corruption, right? That science like. He's he's talking about one guy. Again, I don't know if this story is true or not. Let's let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that it is. This one guy just like really wanted to get to the top of the field and he fabricated something to do so. He's then extrapolating that to the entire scientific community, um, which is completely idiotic, right? That's uh, that's just stupid. The bias is definitely there. The Piltdown Man is one of the most famous fossil fabrications there are. Three different evolutionary biologists collaborated on this project. It's a human skull with a modern ape jaw. They thought that mixing the two would fabricate the missing link, but it didn't. Now they just look stupid on I Am Lucid's YouTube channel that you're subscribed to. Here's a subscribe to my channel, right? No, I am not. Um... So, yeah, you're just doing this again. So uh, if you want to actually talk about the data, you have to talk about the data. You can't just pretend that anthropology doesn't exist, right? If you want to talk about these specimens, you have to acknowledge that they exist and actually talk about them. So uh, I would suggest having a conversation with an anthropologist. I think that if you actually want to learn about anthropology, it's a really fascinating field. I hope to learn more about it myself in the near future. Uh, I'm actually going, hopefully going to be producing anthropology content written for me by Erica, 
of Guts at Gibbon. So that will be very exciting. Uh, there's been some delays, but we'll, you know, ho- hopefully I'll be able to get to that. And then one day I'll have all the anthropology knowledge to dunk on him about this stuff too. But uh, for now, I better with the chemistry. <laughs> it's subscribe to my channel, right? You're subscribed. The Nebraska man. This is a fully constructed, fully fledged human from a wild pig tooth. I can't make this up. The amount of creativity that went into this one was immaculate. How they turn a whole body, a model of a whole body with the arms, legs, bones, everything from a tooth. I mean, I just, I don't know this example. I'm sure he's lying. Whatever, let's get past it. A pig. The Cardiff Giant was made by George Hull, who was an atheist. He lost a debate and wanted to prove how easily he can fool people of religion to believe in their biblical giants. So he hired some guys $3,000 to make their own 10-foot biblical giant and then buried it. This fake fossil ended up selling for $23,000, which of today's time would equal $500,000. I mean, you're just, I mean, you're dunking on religious people now. Um, That's kind of funny, I guess. Unbelievable. The card of giant was believed to be real and was exhibited in multiple museums. 3,000 people actually came out to see it because they thought it was totally authentic. And I mean, this whole, like, I, he's spending a lot of time on this. Uh, this is like doing, like, you know, the crop circles, right? And everybody thought that the crop circles were aliens, and then they weren't. They were just some dudes with planks, and they were good with math, and they could measure stuff. So that was a hoax. Does that mean aliens aren't real? No, there totally could be aliens. They didn't make those crop circles, but he's pretending that crop circles not being aliens means there are no aliens. That's analogous to this situation. That there were a couple of fakes means none of them are real, um, which is completely idiotic, and any anthropologist would laugh in your face. And then we ended up realizing that it wasn't real because he got drunk at a party and revealed that it was fake himself. The pecking man was supposed to be the missing link. Pretty sure that's peaking. But then somehow all of the evidence has disappeared. I'm not joking. It's supposed to be like a homo erectus human being that lived in China. that had huge protrusive eye sockets. But I guess we'll never know because it's gone. Look, you can go there. <laughs> These remains, right, we have so many specimens. They're in so many museums. So when you just say, there was one, but it disappeared, okay, go find another one. Go to a museum and go look at this stuff. It's there. Go check it out. Ask somebody working at the museum to explain it to you. Ask them to explain to you how we know what it is and how old it is, right? There's some, You're just ignoring science you're just pretending anthropology doesn't exist that's all that's happening here and it disappeared out of nowhere they never taught you this in school but darwin was a racist he was also openly sexist and if he was alive today he would be canceled on twitter and his entire theory would have been rejected yeah people used to own slaves too if you owned slaves today you'd get canceled this is classic this is just like the alt-right uh if they don't like something, then it was developed by a pedophile, right? The pe- a pedophile made that, so it's wrong. I mean, uh, Darwin could be could be a murderer. It doesn't make science any less true, right? It came out later that Richard Feynman was a misogynistic douchebag. So what? Quantum electrodynamics stands all the same. The validity of science does not depend on the character of those who develop that science. I'm not a Darwin scholar in, in a historical context. Maybe he was a jerk. I bet he wasn't. I don't know. Who cares? Who cares? The most shocking was when he wrote in his book, written in 1871, uh, titled The Descent of Men, where he says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of men will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. I'm sure you can use your imagination to figure out what he's talking about when he says the savage races. He published this book roughly 62 years before the event took place in Germany that I can't say the name of in this video. Again, use your context clues. They're actually... You can't say World War II? <laughs> um... Yeah, I'm still waiting to get to the part where he explains why I care about this. 
deeply connected. I'll explain how in the next point. But Darwin believed that the white races were evolutionary more advanced than the black races. Darwin's views of gender were not much better. He says that men were more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than women with a more inventive genius. His brain is absolutely larger. The formation of her skull is said to be intermediate between the child and the man. Darwin also says, and I quote, The chief distinction of the intellectual powers of two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up. Then women can, whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands. He added, Thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. Not me saying this, but your boy Darwin. But it doesn't stop. Again, who cares? There, because Darwin would tell the Reverend Charles Kingsley in a letter dated February 6, 1862, It is very true what you say about the higher races of men when high enough, replacing and clearing off lower races. In 500 years, how the Anglo-Saxon race would have spread and exterminated whole nations, and in consequence, how much the human race viewed as a unit would have risen in rank. Remember what risks the nation of Europe ran not so many centuries ago being overwhelmed by the Turks and how ridiculous of such an idea was? The more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turks hollow in the struggle for existence. Looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. All right, I'm like borderline going to start fast forwarding here, like broken record. Uh, yeah, Newton practiced alchemy. Alchemy is stupid, yet Newton was one of the greatest scientists of all time. Who cares? A long time ago, people believed dumb, wrong things. We probably believe something that's dumb and wrong now, today, all of us. And then later we'll know better. Who cares? It does not invalidate an ounce of science at all. Come on, let's get past this. Not only did he predict this, but he created this ideology and gave room to prove it scientifically, which made a lot of negative and nasty things happen throughout history because of his theory. And no, if you live in the USA, you're not safe either because there were previously anti-miscegenation laws in the USA, which made it a crime to let somebody categorize. This is the stuff that Kent Hovind does. He does the whole eugenics and like, you know, all the, all Pol Pot and Hitler and everybody. They, it was all because of evolution. This is ridiculous. The idea that that power-hungry people trying to get political power has anything to do with evolutionary biology is insane. It's just people trying to get power. Okay, this is this is nonsense. He's under a different race. Darwin's theory helped to justify these claims with his scientifically backed racism. These inherent beliefs had been pushed into the theory of evolution from the very beginning and had remained instilled within it, making it extremely difficult to differentiate the difference between fact and opinion. Look, if he if he was saying that, you know what, I want to get in a time machine and go back to the 1860s and tell Darwin off about this sexist stuff or racist stuff, Great, let's go. I'll go with you. Let's go help Darwin be less wrong. Awesome. What does this have to do with evolution by natural selection? What does this have to do with, with four billion years of, of evolutionary history? Nothing. Nothing. This is just, this is what propaganda does, right? This guy is not interested in talking about science. He's interested in He's, he's either fallen for propaganda and is regurgitating it. Actually, that's almost certainly what it is. He doesn't strike me as like a ringleader of propaganda. He fell for propaganda because he, he it resonated with him emotionally, right? That's how you get people like, oh, injustice and oh, all of these bad things is tethered to this, this thing that I want you to reject. I want you to reject science, so let me, let, let me trigger the fear center or the, you know, the guilt or the shame or whatever, and, uh, and tether this message to that to get you to reject what, is, what it is I want you to reject. So he fell for it, and he's repeating it as though it's some pearl of wisdom when he's just sort of displaying for everyone to see how easily manipulated he is. This resonates with the modern theory as well because the evidence seems to revolve around the conclusions and not the conclusions revolving around the evidence, which is how it should be. He keeps saying this over and over again, as though he has a clue what biologists do. He, he can't even accurately summarize what, uh, the, the status of the field, yet he somehow knows 
the methodological practices of biologists. He has no clue what scientists do, and he can't even he can't even adequately bring up, let alone discuss, the evidence supporting evolution by natural selection, or he hasn't yet thus far. We've got how my God, we've got twenty five minutes left to go. Oh boy, all right. For any scientific method, this has actually led to more than a thousand biologists raising doubts and skepticism about the theory of evolution in a joint statement where they say, we are skeptical of the claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Yeah, because natural selection and random mutation alone can't account for the complexity of life. There are many other mechanisms by which evolution operates, and many of the people who signed that know that. And other ones just aren't biologists and don't understand of evolutionary biology and got basically tricked into... This is, this is ridiculous. I mean, I've talked about this a little bit in some of my uh, Discovery Institute content, but this is their malicious thing. Even James Torr has talked about how he got kind of tricked into signing that and has lamented it ever since because he's been blacklist blacklisted from certain sources of grant funding, which in honesty is unfortunate. Um, that shouldn't be how science operates. But and yet he uh, the 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 DI that completely screwed over his career, he's kind of uh, aligned with them now. So uh, how's that for irony? But anyway, um, to be it, it seems he, he's coming back to this DI document for a second time. So um, yeah, this is not this is not good stuff here. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. These are over a thousand scientists, not your- That's not that many, by the way. Um, I don't know if he really understands how many scientists there are worldwide, uh, millions. Um, uh, also, uh, this was sent to all kinds of scientists, right? So th this question is, uh, is of concern for biologists, right? Biologists study life and evolutionary processes. If you ask an astrophysicist this, what, what, why is their opinion worth more than the layperson almost? Right? That's not what they study. They don't have any privileged ability to, to discuss this topic. So uh, most of the people who signed it are not by all, actually, I, I, would, I would venture to say probably all of them are not biologists and thus their opinion is irrelevant. There may have been one or two on there um, that are clearly uh, apologists anyway and not actual biologists. So um, the whole document is a gigantic turd sandwich and that he's obsessed with it uh, is very telling. Not your boy that's a YouTuber. The term eugenics and its modern field of study were first coined by Francis Galton in 1883-1887. Please don't talk about this that long. We already did this. We already talked about this. This is a non-starter. This is, uh, I really, I just, I kind of want to just like let him get through this and get past this. Then drawing on the recent work of his half cousin, Charles Darwin, the practice of controlled selective breeding of a human population to improve the genetic composition, basically forcing survival of the fittest onto a population uh, on what the leader defines as fittest. I'm sure we can all think of a time in history where, where this happened. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously can't say the name of that thing. Matter of effect. Why does he think that you can't say, like, I guess I've never said that word in any of my content. I don't think you get demonetized just for saying it. I'm not going to test it and try. Um, but he's being very dramatic with his editing here. Uh, Darwinism actually played a huge role in the radical ideology. It's how they justify doing what they did with the use of propaganda and a warped pseudoscience and pseudo-moralistic view of Darwinism, they were able to convince thousands, hundreds of... Yeah, the Nazi party uh, made propaganda. Okay, yes, that's what happened. The Nazi party distorted facts, distorted reality. I'm not, I'm not a scholar of Nazi propaganda. Let's say they did distort uh, uh, biology and, and Darwinism to, to, to sell their their hatred <laughs> and the idea of genocide how is that an indictment of biology rather than the nazi party 
this is, I just, how are you going to go down this road? I don't get it. Thousands of people that what they were doing was actually okay and was actually good for the human race. He really thought that he was lending a helping hand uh, to the evolutionary struggle of ex for existence, as he literally quotes himself, the really bad guy in history that I can't say the name of. Actually, I, I would love to get into this deeper and tell you exactly what happened and how the two extremely horrific events that happened on the human earth. That's not what his mustache looks like are linked with Darwinism. So they forced survival of the fittest on everybody around them. Oh yeah, I can't even mention more about this. To, to learn the full part of the, the eugenics part of this video, which I can't say on YouTube to get the full in-depth version of this video, go to IamLucid.com where I will have this section in specific so that you can learn more about the nitty gritty parts of Darwinism that school will never ever teach you. It's on IamLucid.com. Because it's not Darwinism. This is history. This is sociology. It has nothing to do with biology at all. It has nothing to do with biology at all. What are you doing? Once you become a member and support your boy, you can also get a V card while you're there. To, you know, stay in the steel V card, my boy. I'm not even going to ask. I'm not even going to ask what that is. And he has uh, misspelled atheism. Darwin actually wrote private letters that were not made to be public, but they obviously are now, to his Christian friend where he was explaining that he was having a hard time believing in the Christian faith. He had a hard time believing in theism in general, but he did know that a God had to have existed. There, there has to be a God that has made all of this. The design argument still astonished him, and he describes in his own writing that there is a impossibility of conceiving that this grand and wondrous universe with our conscious selves arose by chance. So... Yeah, he also lived uh, 150 years ago prior to the entire field of cosmology, all of genetics and evolutionary biology, uh, right? The, it, it does not matter that Darwin believed in God at all, nor does this really have anything to do with anything. This is this false equivocation that they love to make that in order to accept evolution, in order to, to accept naturalistic explanations for things, that one is inevitably going to be an atheist, which is completely idiotic, right? You can believe in God and accept all of science, right? And in fact, most people who believe in God do, right? I think that, uh, that creationism is a very, is, well, I mean, no, there's probably a lot of creationists. I'm just saying it is very, very possible. And there are indeed religious scientists who believe in God and accept science, accept evolutionary biology, accept Big Bang cosmology, and see it as compatible with their faith. I'm not, I'm an atheist. I don't believe that a God exists. But what do I care if someone, if, uh, if even a scientist says, here's all this stuff that happened, and here's how it happened, and by the way, I believe a god uh, created the universe. I don't care. I don't care at all. This is what baffles me about creationists, is that, and I've said this in my James Tour content, is that they believe in such a loser, impotent god that is incapable of creating a universe with the parameters set in place such that everything can unfold as science knows it to have unfolded. They have to believe in this idiot God that's just like, okay, I made a universe, and hmm, I kind of want like life to happen, so, uh, okay, I got some life, and it's not cool enough, though. Maybe let me, let me do more, like, who wants to worship that God? He's a loser. Worship a much more powerful God that is able to instantly create a universe with, 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 with parameters in place such that all of this unfolds naturally without any intervention. That's a God. That's a, that's a pretty cool God. I don't, if I had to believe in one, it'd be one like that, not one like whoever this one believes in. Darwin still knew that there was no way this could have happened by accident. But he didn't know that. He believed it, right? Newton believed in God, too. A lot of scientists have historically believed in God. They did not have access to the information we have today. That's all. Darwin does also say that he couldn't overlook the difficulty from the immense amount of suffering throughout the world. The guy did have a very, very hard life. His daughter died very young. He went through extreme hardships throughout his life, so I can see why he thinks this way. But at the same time, any person of religion will tell you, yeah, Darwin, that's the point. That's why we're here, to be tested. Life is not made to be fun and easy and happy all day long. 
Why not? If you have a benevolent deity, why couldn't it be? I don't know. But then Darwin also goes on to say, and quote me, I'm telling you, this is exactly what he says, word for word verbatim. Tell this to your teachers in school. Darwin also says, it seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of a god. He also writes this as if it doesn't make any more sense to you. He also writes, um, I had no intention to write atheistically. Darwin is saying this. Yeah, nobody cares. Believe in a God. Nobody cares. You can believe in God and understand that evolution is true. Give it a shot. He had no intention of doing it, but people somehow still were misinterpreting his words and were warping it for their own uh, atheistic ag agenda to make everybody feel like they couldn't believe. Fighting science denial is not an agenda. You have an agenda. In God, actually. The reason that he makes his stance very clear is because his work was actually, at the time, being used as a way to promote atheism or to prove atheism or, at the very least, to deny any form of theism. And I don't think it was. Maybe somebody was doing that. But the point is that modern science has made it possible to be an atheist. The point is that somebody like Newton, who is one of the greatest scientists of all time, obviously was a theist just like almost everyone else around him because there was no way to, to conceive of the mechanisms by which the universe and life could have come about without intervention of a deity because the science wasn't there yet. Now it is. Right Prior to cosmology, prior to genetics and modern evolutionary biology, how could one think of how all of this could have come about? Right, If you go back long enough, we thought lightning was Zeus doing this and that up in the clouds there's all the little angels. We used to not know anything. Then you know more and more and more and now we know a lot. We don't know everything, but we know enough that someone like me can get a basic understanding of cosmology, astrophysics, planetary science, physics, chemistry, biochemistry, biology, geology, right? Just sort of like pretty basic. I'm not an expert in any of those things. Chemistry, maybe more so, but a lot of that other stuff, I just kind of know the basics and I just spread that all out and I look from T equals zero to today and I go, yeah, I got it. That's all cool with me. That's why I'm an atheist, because I don't see any need. The god of the gaps, it, there's no room for one anymore. It's gone, except for, uh, there. to me, there's room right at T equals zero, right? If you want to believe a god went like that and it all started, I'm fine with that because cosmology does not currently have an all-encompassing explanation. But even in the origin of life, and I don't know if he's going to come back to that or not, but if you've watched my James Tour content... You know that the overwhelming majority of people, if you don't work in origin of life research, people don't know what what we know as as a species. What at the science that part of the scientific community, the incredible re research that's going on there, they don't have the background to even understand the research, right? This guy certainly does not. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, there's really not any room for the God of the Gaps in origin of life now either. So there's one spot, t equals zero, beginning of the universe. That's, he's been crammed into that little spot. Used to be everywhere, disease, weather, everything, all God or gods, many gods, um, not anymore. So if you're just flat out admitting that you are uh, worshiping the God of the gaps, that doesn't reflect very well on you intellectually. This was the hijacking of Darwinism. T.H. Huxley was an atheist that used the Darwinian evolution and linked it to atheism. He was debating people of religion and this is what actually caused Darwin himself to start writing about his belief in God and called it absurd. And by I quote, he calls it absurd that you couldn't uh, be, an, be a theist at the same time still accept his version of evolution. Coming soon was Julian Huxley, was actually the grandson of T.H. Huxley, who actually wanted people to become atheists. He had this, this, this want to make everybody around him an atheist. He said that for the modern man, the new religion is Darwinism. And look at today, he's exactly right. He wrote an entire book about this topic and he argues that the same way that today, nobody believes that the world is flat. Uh, in the future, nobody will believe that God exists. All right, I don't know his writings. He could be butchering it. I don't know. Again, one guy says something. Uh, but 
You know, I don't much care if people believe in God. I care if they deny science, right? If you believe in God and you don't deny science, I don't care. But if I'm being honest, I think the world would be better with a lot more atheism. I think it would solve a lot of problems. But I ultimately, that's not my, I don't have an agenda to do, I don't have an, an, an agenda to get people to, to disbelieve in God. I don't care if people believe in God. I care if you deny science. This guy's denying science. So I'm not attacking his belief in a deity or any higher power. I don't care. He was the man who turned Darwinism into a religion and made it directly oppose atheism when Darwin... Darwinism has never, ever been a religion. That's meaningless. Darwin himself didn't say anything of that nature. Coming up next was Richard Dawkins. The eye roll, like, oh, that old guy. <laughs> so Richard Dawkins was a firm atheist, an evolutionary biologist that wrote a book. He's not dead. Does this guy think that Richard Dawkins is dead? I just saw him in person in Vegas in October at a conference. He's alive. Titled The God Delusion, you probably heard about it in the past, where he uses Darwinian evolution as a source to disprove God. Later he says in an interview with Lawrence Cross that if people think to believe in evolution, you need to be an atheist, then all I need to do is convince them of evolution and make them all atheists. I don't think he said that. Uh, also, it's Lawrence Krauss. Um, yeah, <laughs> Dawkins, is, he just, he, he fights back against uh, religious science denial. I mean, I don't, think that, I don't think that he has an agenda to convert anyone to atheism. I don't think any atheists do. Um, but they need this. They need this, like, malevolent opposition in order to like feel like oh i'm on a crusade right it, it, it it's the complete reversal of reality right uh, creationists produce propaganda and then science communicators science communicators have to neutralize it right i am the one that you know i i'll admit i feel a little bit of like a sense of duty like a call to be doing this and he's trying to spin it like I, I'm not me. He doesn't know me. Presumably, maybe he does. But uh, Dawkins is a guy who is just trying to neutralize science denial. But he's trying to pretend that Dawkins is the one that's spreading this thing, and I have to, you know, we have to fight it. And it's like it's just that thing, right? Accuse people of the thing you're doing. That's that's uh, it's it's really twisted. And uh, okay, I won't go so far as to say socio sociopathic, but it's it's uh, it's a total reversal of reality. This guy wanted people. This guy wanted people to become an atheist. He had this, this need. The same way that he goes, guys, knock on your door. Hi, can you please talk about the, the love of our Lord? This guy was the same exact thing as the door knockers, but for atheism. Honestly, he did a damn good job because nearly everybody I know in real life thinks that this is the case. People in real life that I know think that to believe in evolution, you have to be an atheist. I've never met anybody that thinks that. I don't think, I'm pretty sure he's lying. Now, naturalism starts to come into play. This ideology is scary. Okay, this now he's definitely taking a page from the DI playbook here. Um, so I know this, right? We need naturalism. We need this. Uh, it's uh, the denial of a soul, right? When in reality, all it is is just science, right? Naturalism and science are, I mean, science seeks uh, to explain uh, thing, how things occur or how things work by actual physical explanations. That's naturalism. So he's trying to turn it into some kind of ideology, whereas it's really just science. Now, the atheists that I've just mentioned would actually have to accept naturalism as their new age religion in accordance with their hijacked version of it. It's not a religion. At, uh, at best, it's a philosophy. Um, but this is not even in the context of philosophy. It's just, hey, how does that work without resorting to supernatural things that don't exist. Darwinism, obviously. Naturalism is the idea that everything in the universe occurs only as a result of natural phenomena, of natural forces that exist within the universe that are totally measurable. That sounds pretty coherent, but if you don't believe in anything outside the universe or there's no room for divinity, this might make perfect sense to you. Yeah. But there's a few flaws in this school of thought, to say the least. Uh, the worst of is that you cannot believe in free will and believe in naturalism at the same exact time. They actually go against each other. <laughs> if you believe in an omnipotent, omniscient deity, 
then you don't have free will. The complete reversal of reality, again, is just astounding. If there is a deity that made you and knows everything, including everything you'll ever do, you are not free to not do that. How this person does not understand that is really astounding, first of all, but then to have the balls to flip the script, right? I, I don't know if there's free will or not. I think the jury's still out. I, I haven't really looked into this lately. I don't know if we have free will or not. I think there's room for it because there, we still don't have a, a firm grasp on consciousness, but I mean, if you look at a if you look at a bacterium, does a bacterium have free will? I wouldn't say so. It's all right, very rigid, uh, uh, you know, mechanical processes. Us, I feel like we do. You know, why why did I lift my hand? I don't. I just chose to. I don't know. Maybe I don't have free will. And if I do, where is the line? You know, where where is the complexity of of, of self reflection that allows for? free will. And what is the mechanism? You know, maybe there's something quantum mechanical going on. I don't know. But if a, if an omnipotent, omniscient deity exists, you for sure do not have free will. And I'm willing to bet that's the kind of deity this guy believes in. So what are you talking about? Because if you believe that everything in the universe only occurs as a result of natural phenomena, then even the thoughts you're having all the physical and empirical measurable processes happening inside of your brain, all the decisions that you make may be a result of neurons firing a certain way and chemicals being affected by the natural forces in the world, which free will doesn't even hold room for. So look, what if we don't have free will? I don't know. Maybe we don't. So what? That you want to have free will First of all, this just makes zero sense. Wanting to have free will isn't a good enough reason to invent a deity out of thin air, especially a deity that would that would result in you definitely not having free will. There's so there's so many layers of wrongness to this. It's astounding. Well, if you're a naturalist, free will is contradictory to your belief. And if someone decides to do harm to somebody, it can't be their fault because this is a result of natural forces and natural phenomena. So you can't blame that person for doing the worst thing in the world. It's not their fault. It's the natural forces' fault. I mean, like, it's kind of true, even. Like, if you are physically abused as a child, you're way more likely, I don't know the exact percentage, how many times more likely, you're way more likely to physically abuse other people, right? This is just, it's hot, like, cause and effect. Who can deny that there is cause and effect? Now, does that mean that I can't, like, choose what to have for breakfast in the morning? Or I don't know where the, you know, there's different tiers here. But, I mean, none of this, none of this supports, none of this supports the existence of a deity. And it definitely does not discredit any science. So, this is very much a non-starter. Right? Who are they? How can you blame them? Because all they are just a clump of cells and neurons firing inside their brain. To be a naturalist, you have to believe that there is no you, there is no soul, nothing made. There is a me, and there is no soul. Uh, you don't have to believe that souls exist to believe that you exist. Uh, in fact, I know that I exist. It's the only thing I definitely know, as Descartes would say, I think, therefore I am. I know for a fact that I exist, even if I'm a brain in a vat and this is the matrix or whatever weird thing you want to say, I for sure exist. That does not mean that a soul exists and there is no evidence for a soul. Sorry. Makes you, you, besides the physical flesh and brain and, you know, sack of flesh that you're living in currently. This is, uh, not, this is all you are, basically. Just this physical thing that I'm looking at right now. I, I'm, so, I'm just never going to understand why that's not enough for people. I'm never going to understand why someone w can, can even potentially learn all incredible aspects of human anatomy and physiology and all these incredible things and go, oh, is that all? What do you mean, is that all? The human brain is incredible. Like, how is this not enough for you? <laughs> Why do you need, like, a little, like, goo essence thing in the, in your wherever you think it is 
And to do what? To do what? <laughs> it's just so weird. But if you believe in this, then if somebody steals something from you, for an example, it's not their fault because it's a result of their environment. It's a result of their poverty. That's what caused them to actually go and steal. So they can't be punished for it. And you have to completely neglect the fact. Even if there's no free will, people should still be punished for their actions because they can be harmful to society. If somebody kills people all the time, they need to be in jail so they can't kill more people. It doesn't matter if they have free will or not. It's just, there's nothing here. There's nothing here to talk about. That this person is actually guilty. If every single decision their brain makes is just a result of the natural and physical forces acting on it, then there is no self to hold accountable for any actions. This is pure delusion. Without separation of the mind and the body, there can be no such thing as free will. So instead of punishing somebody for doing something really, really bad, we can't hold anybody accountable. Instead of punishment, we should just uh, tell them to just don't do it next time or just give them some rehab instead. Another reason that you're not only a... But they may do it again and that is harmful to society. That's why we have punishments and that's why we have jails. Deck of flesh with no soul or no self is because for an... Ex soul is not self. You cannot make pretend that those are the same thing, right? I have a self. I don't have a soul. That's... Ridiculous. For example, if we tear down a house and then rebuild it with every single part of this house being replaced, then we'd consider this house as being an entirely new house, right? Every single part changed. Similarly, the cells in our body do the same exact thing, except the, the, the retina cells that we have in our eyes. Nearly every single cell in our whole body replaces itself. Yes, and some neuronal cells. Yeah, that's true. Um, so what? So... Yes, we are not just a bunch of cells. We are the pattern in which those cells are arranged. Doesn't really change anything about human biology. We all know that, or, you know, scientists know that, certainly. So with that same logic, if you commit the biggest act of sin in the book, and all that person really is just their physical body, then you should release them from prison and drop the charges after the cells that committed the act have been renewed or destroyed. That's maybe the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, as though the cells are all individual entities conspiring together. And then when it's new cells, it'll be different. I mean, just where? Come on, man. What are you doing? Because from a naturalistic point of view, that wasn't the same person that committed the act that caught them in prison for life. That was their old arm. That was their old body that has now been renewed and changed. So to be consistent with your argument, you would be delusional. But you are the Big Bang and evolution not be- That was a fast cut. Uh, no, my friend, you are delusional thinking that this is a valid argument. Being a choice of men or God, but it's natural selection, natural phenomena, random DNA mutations. Uh, if you believe in this, then you can't blame a divine deity for creation or being the force behind the Big Bang the same way that you can't blame a human being for anything since it's all random. However, there's no such thing as randomness. Uh, that is actually, randomness is a concept which is a byproduct of our lack of knowledge. There is no true randomness anywhere in the entire universe. If I roll a dice, for an example, um, I don't have enough information to tell which number is going to land on based on the air particles and the strength of my hand and the throw velocity and gravity and all of these forces that are actually at play, which means that nothing in the universe is truly random. Just We can call it random because we don't know much about it. I don't think that this is an accurate description of random. Uh, it just means not systematically oriented or arranged by a certain set of criteria, right? The 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 radii of the of the planets' orbits in the solar system are random, right? They're just. It's not like Kepler thought, where it's like this the the Platonic solids, and they have these really particular ratios of the of the of the orbital radii um they're just kind of wherever that's what random means uh i don't know what he's talking about it means that we're ignorant to the true calculation of the events all events occur as a result of their cause that means a cause is the only cause of an event if there is nothing and nothing causes something to exist then nothing can exist there is no possibility of it randomly existing not even in the slightest chance since something has to cause it to happen, then if nothing causes an event to occur, the event won't occur. So there had to have been a source, there had to have been a necessary, a non-contingent, a being that has pure free will, that actually decided to make the contingent thing, which we all are, the entire universe is. Okay, this is, okay, I didn't know where he was going with this word salad. First of all, that has nothing to do, 
that that there is a cause of something doesn't mean it is not random. Then I thought he was talking about like the origin of the universe, which fine, cosmology doesn't have a firm answer for that. Um, but no, that doesn't that things exist doesn't mean a deity exists. So let's see if we're gonna get to the whole like infinite regression of deities problem here. I'm not sure where he's taking this. It must have the creative capacity to create that contingent thing. It must have the ability to create that contingent thing through its intelligence. And that's how we can come to the conclusion that God does exist. It is necessary for the non-contingent thing, let's say is God, uh, to have the free will to decide to make the contingent thing. It must also have the creative capacity to create this contingent thing. And it must have the ability to create it through its intelligence and its power. This is how we can come to the conclusion that there has to be a divine creator behind us. And now we can start to accept the more rational beliefs like I'm not just a sack of flesh. Yeah, so uh, I've seen many, many, many iterations of this argument and they can all be debunked by three words. What made God? Uh, and they get really, really mad when you do this to them. And some of the smarter ones have ways that they like to try to answer it. Uh, but there is no answer. If you're trying to say that uh, that the universe can't simply exist, that it needs to have been created, uh, and you're inventing an infinitely more complex thing to have created that universe, you now must explain the origin of that other thing. Why are you okay with a god that simply exists and not okay with a universe that simply exists? And again, I don't even care if you believe that a god exists that created the universe. Uh, your, your logic is faulty, but I can't disprove that God. So go ahead and believe in, uh, in, in that God. But, uh, I'll, I'll have you know, we're 24 minutes into this and we have talked so little about evolution. I'm actually really disappointed. I don't have as much intelligent things to say here. I thought he was going to be talking about evolution. We've talked probably a total of three or four minutes about evolution. We've talked about this like ridiculous like eugenics angle, this sociological angle. We're talking about God, the existence of God, which has nothing to do with it. Um, are we going to get to some biology here at some point, please? Genetics, that's, that's part of biology. Let's check this out. If you look at our mitochondria, we have mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from the mother and doesn't undergo any sort of variation. This means that we can trace all mitochondrial DNA in every single modern human alive right now back to one single woman. This is called the mitochondrial Eve. And this is thought to be a single woman who survived a genetic bottleneck while all other women died or either couldn't give birth or infertile or died. She was the only one who stayed alive and was fertile. We can't verify this as a fact but since she was the only person alive and we can't say this is a solid fact but i mean rationally we can come to that conclusion because there's no evidence otherwise if the minimum gene count is about 525 though the exact number is disputed there is a minimum number of genes that are required for even the most basic forms of life to have life the genes have to work in perfect order and abiogenesis the theory that we came from uh, amino acids and acids. All right, this guy is jumping all over the place. So he's trying to talk about mitochondrial Eve, and there was maybe something interesting he was going to say there. And then he jumped all the way back to abiogenesis. Um, and uh, just, wow, wow. Uh, he can't stay on topic. So he went ahead. What he's doing now is he's taking the simplest forms, uh, the simplest forms of life today, counting their genes, and saying that the simplest forms of life today, which are the product of 4 billion years of evolution, must be essentially identical to whatever the first living organism was. Uh, that's wrong and dumb. Uh, and he obviously doesn't know this. James Tour doesn't seem to know this, no matter how many times I tell him. The first living organism had no DNA. Anyone who's trying to talk about abiogenesis and they talk about, look at all these genes it's supposed to have, look at all this DNA it's supposed to have, has no clue what they're talking about. Life first, RNA-based genetic code, life, then DNA. So there is, uh, not, there's not really much of an easier way 
to demonstrate your profound ignorance on this topic than by talking about how DNA has to be in the first living organism. Hot pool of water totally misses the mark on the complexity of even the most basic forms of life. The, the most basic forms of life today. Modern bacteria. Dramatically, vastly, profoundly more complex than the first living organism. Genes all have to be in the correct order and bonded by hydrogen bonds and further strengthened by pi pi interactions. Ooh, pi pi interactions. He, uh, he's very proud of that one. They must also be broken up by enzymes to replicate. So the rarity of this happening naturally is like hitting the lottery every single day for the rest of your whole life and then your entire lineage doing the same exact thing. The, I love the, the specificity with which they throw. It's like when they throw out the numbers, right? The one in 10 to the blah, blah, blah. Uh, so when DNA arose, that was facilitated by enzymes. So no, it's not like winning the lottery. I mean, you could argue that it's kind of like winning the lottery that those enzymes arose uh, that generated DNA to replace RNA. Uh, and you could say that about enzymes that generated anything, right? That generated metabolic pathways. I actually would be okay with that analogy. You could say that that is like winning the lottery. But here's the thing. If you play the lottery 10 billion times, you're probably going to win, right? So uh, that is another thing that is not understood here is that when you have a, 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 an astronomical number of opportunities, even things with infinitesimal odds become certain to happen. So you have these uh, sets of molecules in these vesicles uh, and they're self-replicating and you have uh, changes that are occurring. So you're getting different sets of proteins in these vesicles. Some of those vesicles are going to develop sets of proteins that have interesting properties like a metabolic pathway or something like that. Or eventually after the first living organism, the first what we would call the first very, very simple unicellular life that is RNA based. You, we eventually, we, we eventually, there were ones that uh, the, uh, there were enzymes that brought about DNA, and then that replaced RNA as the genetic code. Um, it's uh, it's not that it's it uh, to me it's not that hard to understand, but he clearly doesn't even know. I mean, he just is so unfamiliar with with the entire body of origin of life research that he doesn't know that DNA is not present in the first living organisms. So that's kind of, again, all, all I really need to say here. It's just impossible. Through the study of modern genetics, we can understand that the small genetic mutations can have severe impacts on the rest of the genome and can drastically reduce the organism's chances of survival despite the advantageous characteristics gained. Well, no, if it's disadvantageous, then it's disadvantageous and it's not selected for. So, I mean, this is this is how you can tell how ignorant someone is, is they're, they're not able to compartmental. So like when I think about, not, I'm not an expert or anything, but when I think about this, I think about, you know, origin of life, right? We have abiogenesis over here, and then we have these billions of years of, you know, all this. So when, when you're talking about mutation of a DNA-based genome and natural selection acting upon that. These are very disparate, these are totally different parts of the timeline. So he's talking about abiogenesis, and then he's jumping to this complete other thing and doesn't even realize that he's talking about two different things. That's how you know that someone doesn't know what they're talking about. The complexity of religious temples built around 10,000 years ago called the Gabkli Tipi shows us that we knew very little about the human's knowledge during this somewhat recent time. They had built precise engravings into stones, multi-level structures, they made an, even an oracle room to make and reverberate vocal sound effects to make a powerful acoustic sound. They have richly decorated geometrical patterns of spirals, and because of this, we can understand that it wasn't made for living, had very few or no permanent residents. This site is significant because it goes against the notion that humans were hunter-gatherers at this time, and it highlights inaccuracies within our modern understanding of only 10,000-year-old, very recent human beings. While this argument is not really related to the theory of evolution, it plays a big role in showing how weak our understanding of the past really is. We can't just dismiss their precise and... <sighs> I, I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't know if what he just said is true or not, but he's again doing this thing of like, hey, we didn't know this one thing, kind of, so all science wrong. 
Um, yeah, you can't do that. You can't point at one thing and then go, all oh, this is wrong too. If you want to discredit something, you have to discredit discredit it. If you want to discredit evolution, uh, then you have to be talking about evolution. You can't be talking about archaeology or sociology or something like that. Talk about science. Uh, then again, it's very obvious why apologists spend most of their time talking about not science because they don't understand science and they have no ability to talk about it. And when they do talk about it, they just humiliate themselves, like talking about a pool of amino acids became a, a living organism or something. Um, so that's very telling. Innovative architecture because it shows a lot about them as people. Like when an artist makes a beautiful painting, we can tell about the genius and intelligence behind it. Same kind of concept applies here. Many animals, especially mammals, have psychological adaptations to kill or to eat their deformed young. Now, these animals are literally wired to delete their offsprings if they show large changes in phenotype, like chromosome number changes for an example. So with that said, if a vast number, if a vast change in animals is nearly impossible because of this, then how would they be able to evolve? If they would just delete the animals who show large changes in phenotype, this mechanism uh, actually actively stops evolution and the chances of advantageous characteristics being passed down to begin with. One thing about evolution... Okay, how many animals do that and for what reason, right? We're, uh, we're I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a zoologist. I can't, I don't know how many animal species do that. I know that some, uh, a handful do. Um, but to pretend that that invalidates all of ev I mean, that it invalidates it at all, right? He hasn't looked into this, uh, but certainly extrapolating it to the entire, uh, uh, you know, the entire, uh, you know, biosphere uh, is the word I was looking for, uh, is ridiculous. The solution is that it doesn't explain complex emotions that are disadvantageous to survival. Emotions unique to intelligent life such as sympathy or empathy can lead to hesitation or even death when hunting a prey or when fighting for a territory from the members of the same exact... I mean, you can just Google this stuff. Um, I mean, look, survival, survival isn't just, is the mountain lion going to get me, right? It's also, right, humans are, 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 are a communal species, Right. There, when, when, when you bond and you form a community, that enhances your ability to survive. I mean, you can look at animals that are dramatically different from, uh, from, from mammals. Look at ants. Look at ants and bees. Look at colony-based species. This is a cooperative species. So you can look at that and say, oh, where is the... Where is the survival of the fittest there, right? You've got all the drones that are taking all these subordinate roles, right? Well, the, the ant colony or the bee colony does a lot better surviving that way. So that kind of behavior was selected for. You have cooperative behavior there. It's the same with humans. When you have uh, empathy, which enhances the, the, like the, the mother-offspring bond or father-offspring too, I don't know, whatever, parent-offspring bond, Right, that enhances the the survivability of the species. It's not that hard to understand. It's you just have to want to understand it. You have to want to look into it and learn something. Right, you can just Google why is why do we have empathy? Just Google that from an evolutionary standpoint. You'll get so much stuff. I have a couple tutorials on this in my biology series. Uh, there's uh, you know just learn something. Come on, man. Next species. The ability for humans to have an addiction mechanism, for an example, or even feel guilt or have the capacity for higher thought are all actually bad for evolution. Uh Look, have the, <laughs> having the ability for higher thought is not bad for evolution, right? We, we are at the top of, the, of everything here as animals because of our incredible cognitive ability, right? We have problem-solving ability. We're, we're pretty undeniably the smartest species on earth. You, it, nature is blind. It's not going to develop a brain that has only good things and no bad things. It's, we're going to have characteristics that are side effects of this higher cognitive ability. One of them, I think, is, is <laughs> wanting religion to be true, right? It seems to be like a cognitive defect uh, that we have where we... Uh, I think that by by trying to uh, by 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 
by trying to see patterns in everything, because that enhanced our survival, uh, we attribute patterns to things that, that lead us to, to seek out divinity and things like that. So it's actually kind of a good example of where he's coming from. But um, yeah, this is just, this is a mess here. Uh, but we have these things. These emotions shouldn't have been naturally selected because they're disadvantageous for the species and could potentially lead to its demise. So these things, they get passed down into us, when in reality, if we're just all natural selection, like with no, no limits at all, then we shouldn't have sympathy, empathy, the addiction mechanism, uh, higher thought, and all of the above. Evolutionary psychologists cannot explain the brain's complexity from an evolutionary standpoint, so they make each part of the brain independent and make it seem like each part of the brain is dedicated to a specific function, which actually isn't true. The neocortex is developed over time through synaptic uh, plasticity and not strictly modular, so they totally missed the mark on this once again. Nobody missed the mark, man. Just you, you, <laughs> you, you, you search for little phrases that you can repeat as though you know what you're talking about. You've never actually looked into neuroscience or biopsychology at all. Uh, <laughs> I just don't know what this is. Uh, warping reality to supplement their theory of evolution, like I mentioned in the very beginning. Now, if this neo-Darwinian form of evolution was true, then we'd be surrounded by a bunch of different transitional forms of different creatures, which we're obviously not. Everything is a transitional form. Every living organism is a transitional form. Nature doesn't just go like, oh, I got the thing I wanted. Now let's mess around. Oh, I got another thing I wanted. Everything is a transitional form. Just because it's extant doesn't mean it's somehow privileged. We just happen to live today. Everything that we regard as transitional now, because it's extinct, once was alive. And if you were alive at that time, you would say, oh, that's like the thing nature was going for. I just, this is, uh, yeah, this is pretty rough here. Basic building block of life is ATP. You probably heard about it, adenosine triphosphate. It's an energy carrying molecule that sometimes is referred to as the fuel of life because it's the universal energy source for all living cells. Every living organism consists of cells that rely on ATP to make for their energy needs. Uh, the process of making ATP, though, requires two ATP to already exist. And this poses the question, how was the very first ATP ever created if it requires two ATP to exist? It's like a... It didn't when it first came about, right? We, current existing life, has metabolic pathways for producing ATP, because it was something that was already abundant. Uh, I, I could flash a bunch of papers that uh, show prebiotically plausible syntheses of this and other related molecules. I feel like that would be overkill. Um, yeah. <laughs> molecules came about, and then life that evolved utilized those common substances that were present to figure out how to do things chicken and egg kind of theory. Glycolysis is a process that kickstarts the production of ATP. It converts the glucose into a form that the body can actually use to begin the Krebs cycle. This process requires two enzymes, uh, hexo hexokinase and phoso phosfructokinase. It's a long name, phosfructokinase. Uh, these two require ATP to break down the substrate. These are specifically folded enzymes with a globular structure, which allow the glucose 6-phosphate to enter a like a lock and key mechanism and break down the fructose 6-phosphate. You're just not going to do anything with that? Like, wow, here's this complex thing that exists. And nothing. Yeah, life that is the product of 4 billion years of evolution is, is complex. Incredible. Oh, here we go. Humans and apes share 95% of DNA. So we must have come from apes, right? Well, six, pretty sure it's more than that. 60% of DNA is shared with humans and bananas. So we should be about half banana and 98% is shared with a pig and 90% is shared with a cat, 85 with a mouse, 84 with a dog, 80% with a cow. So with this logic, we must have come from apes, bananas, pigs, cats, dogs, cows, and mice. Not come from, share ancestry with. One more time. Not come from, share ancestry with. Mice. To the unlearned and impressionable mind, the fact that we share a large portion of DNA uh, with a different species, for an example, or even a fruit, to say the least, uh, it might be enticing to believe that we came from them. 
However, this is a very basic understanding of DNA and its roles in the human body. The Human Genome Project, which mapped around 98% of the genome, found that less than 2% is of human DNA is actually active and carries any significance. To put this case to rest though, a 2005 study from Pennsylvania State University claims and concludes that although nucleotide sequence identity between humans and chimpanzees is very high, only 20% of proteins are identical between the two species and 80% of proteins are different. Even the 80% protein differences appear to be too small to explain the phenotypic differences. Case closed. The Case closed what? We're not genetically identical. Who cares? We have a lot of similarity because we diverged very recently in the grand scheme of things. We're much less similar to bananas because we diverged much, much longer time ago. In fact, almost certainly, I mean, I would imagine it would be when life was exclusively unicellular, right? That's when that divergence would have occurred. But even unicellular life requires metabolic pathways, right? So there's some similarity with metabolic pathways and things like that, so there's some similarity uh, at a, uh, even when there was when life was entirely unicellular. Um, yeah, this is just a Kent Hovind thing, right? You know, you believe you came from uh, this or that or whatever. Uh, you're just completely missing the point. The difference in humans and apes goes all the way down to DNA splicing differences. This changes the way that the genes are expressed at a molecular level. But honestly, after the last point. What other level, on what other level can genes be expressed than the molecular level? I don't even have to explain this one. If you want to just read the source for yourself, go ahead and do so. I'm straight on explaining that. That translates to, I did not read it, do not have the capacity to read it, and have nothing intelligent to say about it. I'm just going, this science proves the thing I'm trying to say, even though it doesn't. Uh, and you read it if you want to, but I know you won't. Humans and various mammals share deviated forms of the pentadactyl limb. For an example, apes have five finger bones, humans have five finger bones. Uh, birds have five main bones in their wings, whales have five main bones in their fins, cats have five bones in their paws, and because of this, evolutionists use this as evidence that we must have come from a common ancestor, and that this common ancestor has a pentadactyl limb that we've taken that trait from. However, if we look into our evolutionary tree of life, we can see that the pentadactyl limb actually disappears and then reappears throughout history, so it's always coming and going. There's actually a PubMed study that proves this by Cameron Seiler and Rafe Brown that says, the results of our study join a nascent body of literature showing strong statistical support for character loss, followed by evolutionary reacquisition of complex structures associated with a generalized pentadactyl body form. Now this proves that a once big proof of evolution is actually pointing towards its own disproof. No, it isn't. You just can't read what you just what you just read. You you said words but you didn't actually read it. So, uh, biologists don't go, oh, these two things have five fingers. These both have five fingers, so they're related, right? We're, we, they're, you're looking at lineages. You're looking at evolutionary li lineages. What that thing just said is that there's a lineage. We can trace this lineage where there's some character loss, and then later down the road, something is regained or some other change occurs. There, you're, scientists don't just go, oh, like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's about right. They look the same. They came from the same thing. There's just so much more going on. There's so much more going on with genetics, the fossil record, etc. It's it's uh, it, this is the main. This is something that that uh, that evolution deniers like to do, is they trivialize and and like they try to look at one line of evidence and go, see that alone doesn't prove it. And yeah, that alone doesn't prove it, right? Similar morphology alone doesn't prove. A particular kind of ancestry, but that's not how science works, where right? you have all these different lines of evidence, and when they all agree on something, that corroborates that assessment. That's how people do science, right? So uh, that's why evolution deniers like to go, give me your one best evidence for evolution. Well, what do you mean one best evidence? That's not how science works, right? Science doesn't conclude things based on this very minimal amount of data. That's the point. We look at all of this disparate data and synthesize all of it with this one elegant model that explains all of these things, predicts all of these things that are routinely verified, right? That's how science works. He's just trivializing the scientific process. It came back and slapped itself in the face because if the limb can evolve and then de-evolve and then evolve... It's not de-evolution. It's always just evolution. Whether it goes in a particular direction or whatever it is, right? It's just, it's, it's evolving based on its environment. 
That's what's happening. Well, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that we must have got it from a common ancestor because it can always come and go between the different animals and species. Darwinists actually claim that we have some residual body parts and muscles left over from our previous evolutionary self that we actually don't even use anymore that are totally pointless that actually prove evolution. Let's disprove that. The ear muscles, actually, are not useless even though you're told they probably were. The VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex, is a reflex within humans in which auditory cues such as fast clicks or tones can guide the eyes towards a location called gaze shift. The ABR and PAM are examples of such reflexes starting with the superior ocular muscle which was to be useless, but in reality, it's not. So these muscles actually provide strength and support to the ear, which is seen by in cranial muscles, as well as supporting and guiding cartilage growth during development of the ear when you were a little baby. Darwinists claim that the appendix... Yeah, obviously, appendix, and then he's going to do all... Yeah, he's going to do the vestigial tail, probably. Um, so, uh, disproving the vestigial nature of something does not mean that there is no such thing as vestigial structures. Obviously, they are, there are vestigial structures, right? There are many of them. X is useless and was once used to digest a heavy leaf diet. However, that's not true at all. The appendix is a part of the immune response and contains lymphoid cells. These are believed to be a part of the lymph, the T and B lymphocytes mediated immune responses. Also, it acts as a backup for the digestive bacteria held within the human body. When a person suffers from a disease, for example, such as chloria, a lot of their digestive bacteria is actually flushed out in the GI tract and the appendix can actually release the digestive bacteria to kickstart the gut microbiome for important digestion. Once again, a lack of knowledge plus a longing and desire to make the theory work is how anybody can come up with the idea that we don't need our appendix anymore and it does nothing for us. The Lack of knowledge and a desire. <laughs> this guy is just describing himself. Marius longus is a muscle seen that is a remnant of evolution that is currently useless entirely. When in reality, a new study actually shows us that 54% of the population has this muscle, but 96% of all elite athletes have this muscle. So further tests into sports that required grip strength also revealed that there's similar disparities, that when sports need you to actually grip something tough, this muscle does actually have some use. The human tailbone, this is definitely misrepresented as the remnants of a tail from our ape ancestors, when in reality, it's actually connected to the pelvic floor muscles providing balance for humans to stand up and sit up straight like I'm doing right now. That doesn't mean it's not the remnant of tail-like structures. Uh, and, and notice that he did not go into the vestigial uh, tail with fetal development, right? You, fetal development is, is the best... Uh, way to to uh, talk about vestigial structures because you have uh, human uh, embryos developing through stages that do not even remotely resemble the morphology that it'll eventually become, right? If you have a god that's creating everything exactly like it is, why would the morphology of a fetus ever be anything other than the eventual morphology of the organism? Why would it go through this weird like fish stage and all these other things? Uh, because these are these are remnants of uh, our evolutionary past. An ape has 48 chromosomes and a human has 46 chromosomes. Now the theory says that chromosome 2 fused and to make it into 46. That's how we went from being apes to humans, or that's one of the proofs of it, supposedly. But when a chromosome fuses, it gives rise to a satellite DNA that leaves behind a signature. At the fusion site, there is a, usually a lot of telomere signature, about 10,000 to 30,000 bases, but there's actually 768 bases at the supposed site, which is 10 times less than what is expected. The supposed fusion site also doesn't fit the traditional chromosomal fusion point use case. When a gene fuses, it has to fuse in a way that's um, like the least destructive so that it tends to fuse at the least useful parts of the chromosome. However, this gene is expressed in over 255 different cell types and is co-expressed further with other genes. The fact that this gene is so active and strongly used it kind of refutes the idea that this was a product of chromosomal DNA uh, fusion and that we once had 48 chromosomes back when we were apes it doesn't really make sense also okay again we are apes uh i don't know actually i've never heard this what he's talking about because i don't i i didn't yeah i don't know about this i heard he was talking about telomeres telomere fusion i think what he's say i i, I think he's talking about like the tel telomeres at the end of the chromosomes if you have chromosomal fusion you should have this big section of telomeres in the middle i think that's what he's talking about uh so maybe a bunch of it was deleted, right? There's deletion of, uh, of sections 
of DNA. Um, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I'm not even going to comment on the rest because I'm not familiar with this exact example he's talking about. Well, another point is that the organism that received this chromosomal fusion would have fewer chromosomes than its partners and look very different. And even if it did survive, it would not be able to pass on its genes and chromosomes because you can't viably reproduce with someone that has more or less genes than you. They have to be the same amount. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is a nerve that goes from your lower brain to your aortic arch and then back to your larynx. Now the evolutionary biologists claim why didn't it go straight from your brain to your larynx, why does it have to go to your aortic arch instead? Now they say this is either an imperfect creation, disproving God, is this some sort of evolutionary residue? So they get this because fishes also have this and they also have multiple aortic arches because they have- And giraffes where it goes way down and way back up. Oxygen coming in from one direction and they have blood traveling in the other so they have to have multiple. The theory claims that humans evolved from fish and this would be their proof of it. Now since this makes sense for fish but not for humans, they claim since we don't have multiple aortic arches today then the one that we have is a result of back when we were fish or a residue of evolution of some sort. I, I think he's looking for the word remnant. I don't think residue means much here. Uh, but yes, there are aspects of, of human anatomy that are remnants of the anatomy of, of, of organisms further back in our lineage. Um, that's pretty undeniable. Sort, And it's actually currently pointless. Uh, however, as, as babies, as like a four-week-old fetus, we do have multiple aortic arches, and it makes sense to have the nerve go through the main aortic arch that we have today because as a fetus, we need the nerve to go around the arch in order to work and ensure that the larynx develops properly. Now, we can see this definitely does make sense. At four weeks old, we have to have this so that we can develop properly. But instead of that, these evolutionary biologists start to claim, oh, we have something that we don't know the answer to? Evolution. It has to be it. We're going to draw all the evidence to the conclusion every single time and never the other way around, like I continue to mention to you. Never the other way around. No, uh, uh, how about apologists never actually learn about the things that they're trying to talk about? That would be a much better conclusion to draw here. Now this is an example of true evolution that we can actually witness, prove, and empirically study instead of making these bold outrageous claims. That is our wisdom teeth for an example. I obviously agree with this. Maybe our ancestors had more primitive diets that consisted of like tough meats, uh, raw plants, hard nuts. Our wisdom teeth are actually remnants of our ancient diet and our proof of science backed evolution, not baseless theories. So this, we all should agree with. But next we have the Tibetan tribes that underwent the fastest genetic changes out of all of human history to adapt to high altitudes. The tribes lived in the Tibetan plateau, which was about 13,000 feet above sea level. And at such high altitudes, only like 40% of the oxygen that we get is, is what they would get up there. So they have to learn how to live or adapt to survive with such a low amounts of oxygen. The gene variation took place at the EPAS1 gene, which regulates the body's response to low oxygen environments and their bodies adapt by carrying more oxygen carrying pigment called hemoglobin. In only 3000 years, the frequency of the gene grew from 10% to 90% in Tibetans. This is a legitimate example of evolution. We have concrete evidence that this gene variation actually did take place through natural selection to keep the Tibetan mountain tribes alive. We can prove this. We don't make the radical assumption that because they can more efficiently, you know, use oxygen at higher altitudes means that they were previously birds. No, we just say that over 3,000 years, they had to make it live up there. So naturally, they were naturally selected to have higher gene expression of the EPAS1 gene. So he's just describing proof of evolution, attempting to somehow straw man it as though a biologist would say, well, I don't understand what this used to be birds thing uh, means. Um, but he's describing an evolutionary process and then stubbornly continuing continuing to deny evolution. Uh, this doesn't really, again, make, make much sense to me. Um, I think the problem here is that uh, he doesn't understand that these processes that are going on are the same that produced all of the what he would dub macroevolution um, as well. He just doesn't have any actual understanding of... Uh, how the genome changes and what that means for gene expression and what that in turn means for morphology and uh, physiology. Um, so yeah, he's, he's admitting that evolution happens and then not connecting the dots from there. We're not going to make those radical claims like these neo-Darwinists. The Bahu fishermen tribes in Southeast Asia have evolved 50% larger spleens than nearby communities. 
Even members of the tribe that actually didn't dive still had larger spleens, which shows us that it's a genetic variation and not just enlarged through training or practice, you know, similar how freedivers would actually do it in today's time. They spent nearly five hours underwater every single day and could actually hold their breath for far longer than any other average human being could, obviously, because of their variation in gene. The PDE10A gene was variation responsible for the thyroid function and spleen size. This tribe has adapted to their environment. They can hold their breath for longer. They can dive better. They have larger spleens. But because of this, we don't go and make the outrageous claims that they came from sharks, do we? This is an example of evidence-backed evolution. Similarly, came from sharks. I mean, they're, they're not shark-like. They're humans. What does this mean? What are you saying? You're describing evolution that happens, admitting that it happens, and then using evolution to try to discredit evolution. This doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't go and make such an exaggerated claim saying that human beings came from apes. The fact that this is taught in school is a problem. You go from learning that factual evidence your entire life in school, and then by age 14, your biology teacher tells you that, yeah, we came from apes, and then you just have to believe it because here's the book and here's all the evidence. Yeah, here's the book and here's all the evidence. So you could read it, um, and if you had read it, you again would know that we are apes and you would have seen all of the evidence and all of the morphological intermediate characteristics that you want to see, right? The, the evolution that you're describing right here that you admit is happening, if you extrapolate that over millions of years, it's not that hard to see the evolution from earlier hominid species to humans. They're not even that human or that, that different. They're not, you're not even that different. You're not even uh, lowering yourself to the Kent Hovind style like, how do you get from a whale to a pine tree or whatever it is, the stuff that he tries to say by, by cherry picking two completely disparate forms. You're talking about other hominid species to humans. You just explain how evolution does happen and you can't connect the dots and understand that over millions of years, very slight morphological changes, right? A little less hair, standing more upright, slight changes in, in, in the skull and the brain and, and, and shorter arms. What are you not getting here? What are you not understanding? I mean, you could have read that book. You could have read that textbook and actually learned something. I don't know. It's a theory. It's nothing more than a theory. Oh, my ultimate pet peeve. Um, yeah. Uh, theory is not an antonym of fact. It does not mean guess. I've said this so many times that I don't even want to do it. Uh, the theory, a theory is the highest structure in science. It is the highest structure in science. It's the most powerful construct in science. Uh, that you don't know what a theory is uh, invalidates you at, 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 at just right off the bat. Uh, people who don't know what a theory is have no basis trying to discuss, let alone discredit science. But it's being taught as a fact. Neo-Darwinian evolution is biased, narrow-minded, and propagated similar to a religious cult that the followers of it claim to be so against. Thank you. No, it's propagated like science because it is biology, which is a science. For all being here, I love you so much. If you want to debate further on this, I have a Discord down below. You can join that and debate all you want or in the comments down below, or you can just cancel me on Twitter. Thank you for coming to the end of this video. I love you. Mwah. Stay dreaming. Stay lucid. I'm out. Peace. So I didn't really know what to expect there. Um, I guess we got into some science at the end, but um, I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that this was going to be just textbook apologetics. It's as though he went through a bunch of DI, Discovery Institute content, or like Answers in Genesis message boards or something, um, collected a bunch of talking points and is regurgitating them. Um, I don't really know why he chose to make that content. I really don't, I don't know what else he really does on the channel. Just glancing at his homepage doesn't look like he makes that kind of content. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if he'll see this, don't really care. Um, if you do see this, uh, why, why, why did you do that? Um, I hope that you're embarrassed that you made that. Um, yeah, I just think that, uh, you know, in the future, if you want to talk about a topic, uh, especially science, 
you should probably try to learn literally anything about that topic. Um, I mean, even just like Googling words, like, first of all, you should know what a theory is. You should know what a theory is. Um, you shouldn't be using words like neo-Darwinism if you don't know what they mean. They actually mean something. Um, so you shouldn't just regurgitate the bastardized version you heard from apologetics. You should take some responsibility and actually learn something. Um, and then you can avoid this kind of situation in the future where someone has to pick apart your content like this. Anyway, I don't know. Um, I think that was kind of fun. It's more just frustrating uh, because I've heard these talking points a zillion times and every time people keep repeating them over and over again, uh, it gets a little aggravating. But anyway, uh, maybe hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you did. If enough people enjoyed it, maybe I'll do more of this. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all for now. Take it easy.